So a little bit about my background. I am a computer science major with a concentration networking. I've uh, been working in the security intelligence industry for about eight years now. I've supported uh, numerous agencies, NSA, CIA, uh, NGO, DNI, um, and I've had a blast to be honest with you. So um, most of the stuff that I know with the networking side and hacking side, I'm self-taught, but uh, I won't get too deep into the weeds. I'll kind of stay on at the uh, 10,000 foot level where uh, I can explain things and have everybody understand where I'm going and where I'm coming from. All right. So uh, I understand that uh, mainly these, the audiences are students and graduate students. So I'll talk to that. Um, um, let's see. If you're interested in cyber related technologies, um, and if you're a graduate student where many of the cutting edge technologies will be coming up and you'll be exposed to, this talk will be definitely be uh, of interest to you. All right. um, if you're a classic movie buff, many, some may remember the scene in the movie The Graduate where an older gentleman grabs a young Dustin Hoffman by the collar and says, um, do you understand the future? The future is plastics, he whispers. Well, if they were to remake that movie this year, or now, the, uh, the magic word would be wireless. Like, everything's wired, wireless now, um, and going towards wireless uh, technologies. Um, look at the iPad, the phones, smartphones. Uh, it's, you can see it migrating that way. Um, and unless you've been living in a cave and not observed the rapid proliferation of wireless devices and networks, uh, I'll do a quick uh, survey and bring up the date. All right. Here are a few facts that may be of interest. There are uh, nearly three times as many cell phone users in China as there, in, as there is in the United States. So there's about 800 or 8 million, 853 million 400 users versus our entire population in the United States, which is about 300, 300 million. Uh, last year, the number of cell phones in China was approximately double uh, the number of internet connections that that country had, which means <laughs> there are about 853 million uh, internet connections versus, or phone users versus internet connectors. Um, let's see. As most of the phones become internet enabled, the number, the number of internet connections will converge and the population, with the population of the countries. So what that means is, as countries uh, become more connected, their population will also be connected. So if you look at India and China, those countries will definitely uh, grow <laughs> their connections uh, in the near future. Um, let's see. So therefore, the preponderance of internet connections and the geographic center of network traffic will shift outside the boundaries of the United States and Western Europe. So uh, what that basically says is maybe today the main concentration of network connections are originate from the U.S. and Europe because that's where it really started. Well, eventually it's going to shift and shift quickly to India and China. All right. Um, there might be some correction to this shift due to the relative wealth of the countries. And as you, most of you have been paying attention to the news, uh, a lot of money is moving towards the Asian markets and the emerging markets. And that's where a lot of the new network connections are going to come up. And that's where a lot of the uh, internet ISP providers and phone providers will invest heavily in. Uh, there might be some correction. Let's see. Many of those internet nodes. Will, be, will not be tethered, such as automobiles, clothes, products on the store shelves, etc. Many of the things currently tethered will no longer be tethered due to cost. Examples, computer and business. Uh, I've been to many facilities now where they're starting to use iPads, uh, wireless devices, and such. All right. And uh, it's only going to become more pervasive in that manner. 
Now consider the problem that every wireless network and connection can become potentially a cyber attack vector. So uh, anything you can think of that has RF emanations or can receive RF signals uh, can be a vector. When I mean a vector is once it's penetrated, they can, people can use that device to pivot around a network security system, firewalls, whatever, and bypass uh, the built-in infrastructure, security infrastructure. And next year, you will be able to use smartphone equipped with near-field communications like your credit card. Uh, uh, one, let's see here, let me show you. Just today, I was reading in uh, the New York Times um, that the, uh, the industry is going to move towards near-field technology for your cell phones. It's already being adopted and, and uh, used in the Asian Pacific Rim and other countries. So eventually, it's going to come over here. The only hurdle it has is basically uh, collaboration and uh, everybody getting on the same page, basically, to push this technology out. So you, if you can imagine um, RF enabled phones uh, taking the place of your credit card. That will be the future and it's, uh, it opens up a whole new domain of security, uh, <laughs> security concerns for people like us. So when you guys get out in the industry, most likely you will be facing these type of, type of technologies. And uh, the problem that we will face definitely is staying ahead of the wave. Since I've graduated, I've always been trying to keep up and stay ahead of the wave because if, uh, if you don't, well, it's going to pass you by um, and pass you by quickly. So, so let's see here. Let's go back up here. So currently, in, well, last year as of June, um, this, you know, this chart shows the, uh, the breakdown of network users or internet users throughout the world. You know, obviously, Asia is huge. <laughs> and most likely will be continue to be huge for the near future. How scary is that, right? Um, and, what, and what does this mean for the future? Well, it just means more and more people will have access to the internet and more and more of their information will be available online and be available for uh, hackers or uh, criminals to gain access to and utilize for their own you know, ill-gotten goods. So. Uh, it's one thing that we all have to pay attention to and strive to help uh, fix because um, it's not going to go away for sure. I'll give you an example here. In 2007, hackers trolled the parking lot of, of malls and hacked into wireless access points of sales of point of sale systems and stole 46 million credit cards, debit cards, and associated PIN numbers, proving that wireless hacking can be big business. This was the TJ Maxx attack not too long ago in 2007 where uh, someone with, <laughs> with a uh, directional antenna basically just sat in their car with a laptop that could sniff wireless packets and apparently TJ Maxx didn't encrypt their uh, wireless signals uh, coming out of their building and they sat there for months just pulling down information um, that affects all of us you know because uh, when they compromise a banking system a lot of those costs uh, filter down to us. So it's a huge issue um, to stay ahead of those guys too. Um, see, a recent, I don't know if you all heard of the recent Stuxnet uh, attack on the uh, Iranian centrifuge facility. Well, um, <clears throat> the group that I work with, we do a little bit of research on that and um, we, uh, we definitely enjoy uh, <laughs> reverse engineering things of those uh, natures. And let's see here, the recent Stuxnet attack which occurred which, according to the malware analysis, jumped from network air gaps to target uranium centrifuge motors, could be replayed with wireless entry points instead of thumb drives. Breaking Point System, which is a vendor we're working with, recently constructed a model of such wi wireless malware propagation, showing how it could be used to bring down all production services. Um, I don't know if you know how Stuxnet started, but there was a lot of uh, talk about it was government-sponsored I'll just ignore that part. The way it got into the system was basically through a thumb drive. The typical weakest link in the uh, security chain is people. Um, I've heard plenty of uh, my colleagues 
say when they do penetration tests in around facilities and colleges, what they do is uh, they would throw thumb drives in the parking lot, you know, even though the parking lot's fenced off and it's uh, in a secure facility, they would they could just huck it over the fence. And six, seven times out of ten, someone will pick it up and plug it into their computer thinking, oh, I just got a free thumb drive, you know, 32 gig thumb drive, awesome. But uh, lo and behold, it's, it's, it's uh, infected with malware or Trojans or uh, um, something bad that will call back to the central command system. So just be aware of stuff like that. Uh, that's the world we're living in. And uh, it's not like dumpster diving is out of you know, fashion. But that's in fashion now, throwing thumb drives over the uh, fence. So um, in 2008, researchers led by Stephen Myers from Indiana University looked at how wireless routers are designed and concluded it could be possible con to construct an airborne worm that guessed password administrator passwords on wireless routers and then instruct the routers to install new firmware, new firmware which would run, uh, which would in turn cause infected routers to attack other devices in the range. Using data compiled from the wireless geographic logging engine, they mapped out wireless networks in which routers are no more than 48 yards from adjacent networks. In New York City, they es estimated that approximately 39,000 networks may be susceptible to the attack. Now, when uh, John Morrison, my manager, came to me and talked to me about this, I was thinking, well, this, this is kind of bad. This would be like hitting the nuke button for a major mo metropolitan area because once you infect one one router and it and there's a chain reaction where it infects every other router around it and nodes cleaning out one section of the city will not fix the problem you have to clean it out all at once otherwise it'll just re reproduce itself and that's a really that's a logistical nightmare it's almost i would say impossible unless <laughs> you can get it into everybody's uh, home or office and reset it at the same time so uh, that is would be a nightmare scenario um, and uh, my team and I, we've actually, we actually can flash firmware uh, with uh, with some of our skill in our lab with uh, with remote technology. So uh, it it is doable. And we've proven so. Um, it's just a matter of time <clears throat> that the bad guys can get their hands on it. Um, in May 2010, Defense Systems reported that the U.S. Army forces in Afghanistan are experimenting with small and sophisticated aircraft packages that exploit the electromagnetic spectrum. The article said that the basic components of airborne, airborne electronic cyber attacks are a sensor that can map an enemy network, the precise location of an antenna that feeds the network, an, elect an electronically scanned array antenna that can generate a data stream packed with inquisitive algorithms in order to enter and exploit a target enemy network. So what does that mean? Basically, uh, it means that <laughs> um, the DOD and the military are already thinking of new vectors of attack into networks, um, launching blimps, launching uh, our RC helicopters, maybe with a phone hang, hung underneath of it that could spit out RF signals. Um, so it's just things that are out of the box that you would not think about. We are thinking about, and the, definitely the uh, the government is thinking about and are acting on. So it's it's a fun realm. So when you graduate, uh, these are the opportunities that you can actually uh, get into and, and learn and in advance. You know, it's. It's a very fast-moving field. I have to admit that. I, I can barely keep up with it myself. Sure, wireless networks are vulnerable, and smartphones are targets of attack, and can be platforms for launching cyber attacks. But the world is finding these, de these devices invaluable. So we'll see a lot more of them. Here are a few reasons why. So basically, that paragraph summarizes the fact that we will we're spoiled. We need these technologies now. We can't do without them, and if, if you take it away from us, we're going to complain and moan and whine. Uh, so there's, there's going to be a balance. 
between having these devices and security. All right. So here are a few, reason why, a few reasons why. Smartphones and tablet computing devices with their mobility, small form factor, high-end graphics, multiple radio channels, onboard sensors, growing computational power, and built-in encryption are forcing organizations to rethink how they do business and execute missions. The edge becomes increasingly central to how work is performed. Data is stored and distributed, and mission security is achieved. So um, my customer, the current customer I'm working with right now, we definitely have uh, a hard problem where they want to deploy uh, secure mobile devices to um, soldiers in the field. Now, now to um, secure that is a whole different matter because we're talking about pushing out secret level and top secret level information to the phones, which have never been done before. Well, P President Obama may have a special BlackBerry that he uses, um, but that's like a custom <laughs> arrangement that the NSA provided him. Now, magnifying that by hundreds of thousands to our troops is a whole different story, all right? So, and that's one of the problems that our customer and, and Lockheed Martin is running, running into and in providing research towards. If anybody has any questions about what I'm talking about, or or is would like me to further expand upon the information, please let me know. I'll be glad to uh, talk to it as much as I can, uh, without going over the uh, my limitations of uh, classification. All right. Organizations, including Lockheed Martin, are now defining how mobile devices integrate into operating environments, such as battlefields, secure facilities, hospitals, financial transaction systems, banking systems, and logistical systems and entertainment. Um, like I said, today I just read about this, uh, this article about near field technology. I pulled the image off and I put it in the, uh, the presentation here. That's how fast these type of technologies evolve. Uh, whatever we're using now has been researched and developed probably at least five years ago. So whatever, whatever that's being researched now will be present uh, in about five or less years. So a key point to remember, in the hands of a user, the same device used to download a game may function as a credit card to purchase goods and as an operational window into uh, sensitive information. The U.S. government sees a lot of potential in these devices. They consider them game changers. The government likes to use those words, game changers. So um, my manager, John Morrison, went to a cyber mobility conference last week, and he provided me a lot of this data. And these, this information basically are the point of view of the government and a lot of the uh, military institution. This is what they want to go to and what they want to uh, adopt. So this is not Lockheed's adoption. This is what the government and NSA and the DOD wants to do. All right. The main takeaways. It is DOD policy that all mobile platforms, applications, and networks used for inf sensitive information be certified and credited through the NSA. So it's NSA's charter to certify secure systems. It's particularly dealing with um, government facilities and secret level and top secret level and sen sensitive information. If you, ca if you can't get a mobile device approved for type 2 encryption, DOD is not interested. Basically, you can't just pick up a, a phone and say, hey, yeah, why, why can't we just use this? Well, the problem is a lot of the signal being transferred is not encrypted, and uh, any Joe Schmo with a uh, scanner can pick it up. All right? Or if they get a hand, their hands on the uh, device itself, um, well, they can basically just look at the phone, download all the information, and return your phone without you really knowing it, which some places do, especially at airports. Uh, without DOD sec security accreditation, requirements can be waived only at the highest level of an organization. This sentence is loaded. This is a loaded <laughs> uh, sentence because getting accreditation or changing a cornerstone of security within the government is very, very difficult. Uh, 
say, say a certain, say any agency, if they deal with uh, classroom information and they want to bring in RF or wireless type device, uh, it is impossible, basically, to get that approved because uh, there is no system right now that allows for that. Um, um, and no agency wants to stand up and take responsibility saying, yeah, sure, we'll accredit that type of system, but if it gets hacked or compromised, well, it's not our, it's not our fault, but we're accrediting it. So there's no agency that wants to do that. And, and that's a main problem. That's a big problem. Uh, and with the 16 different Intel communities, for all of them to sit down and collaborate together is also difficult. Uh, the president created the DNI, or the Director of National Intelligence Agency, to uh, better collaborate, to better put everybody on the same page. But um, they are also having issues uh, working um, across domains. DISA will be the mobile virtual network operator. So if this were to come to pass and uh, this system would be, would be adopted, DISA would be the AT&T or the Verizon for the government. DOD will issue and control its own SIM cards for mobile devices. So basically this is a whole separate ISP system, uh, separate from AT&T and Verizon, so they they want to control it bolts nuts um, as much as possible. But there are compromises that need to happen because well, the devices that they want to use are regular devices that you and I have, like an iPhone or Android or a iPad Touch. Okay, see, uh, DoD will set up a government app store. Believe it or not, they want to mirror. Apple's App Store, because it's so successful, and it's been brought up numerous times. You laugh, but it's true. They, they've come to us numerous times saying, can you guys think of a way to create a military app store for us? And by the way, you guys populate it with the apps that you want to create, and we'll pick and choose what apps we want. So... <laughs> Just don't call an app store. Apple will sue you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's another thing I read in the news today. So, um, needless to say, that is a, an interesting uh, possibility for companies and contractors if they want to grow in that uh, field is, <laughs> do they really want to stand up <laughs> their own application store for the military? Because it costs a lot of money to f f uh, stand up those facilities. All right. Let's see here. I can skip that. DoD will set up Synapse Store. The ASD Joint Planning and Development Office, U.S. Air Force, is working on business model for developing mobile apps. And Lockheed Martin has volunteered to assist that. So, um, like I said, the numerous DOD companies, uh, DOD agencies, and uh, intelligence agencies are highly motivated uh, to get a preliminary system up and running, a proto protocol type system up and running. Or, let's see, an RFP on mobile device application development system will be coming out soon and will define how secure mobile apps are developed. So, um, this is not just talk, they're actually going to release an RFP requesting uh, program support for this. So there's going to be money backing this up. And by the time you guys get out, uh, you may, some of you may be working on these types of, these types of systems. Uh, have you, has anybody heard of this before? This type of information? I was just curious because uh, the world I work in, I hear it all the time. I'm just not sure if it's been exposed to the collegiate field yet. If it has, just let me know. I don't want to bore you with uh, stuff that you've ever heard of. So um, I'm a, I've highlighted a lot of these, uh, these columns here just to focus on some of the things that uh, are interesting to me and possibly to you. Uh, they want to use commercial devices, iPhones, iPads, Androids, instead of creating a whole new device from scratch. Uh, NSA will approve the devices. 
and system and uh, basically they want remote desktop session for the uh, field users the guys in the field all right soldiers um, there is no specific platform for them to go to they want they want it to be ubiquitous across the board and uh, uh, for flexibility and they want to give basically give every soldier a smartphone that they can use all right so DISA will be the ones who will be maintaining the system basically your service provider uh, in this case and I've highlighted these bullet points here just to let you know where why uh, security is such a, an issue they'll have access to sensitive data access to enterprise data military software entry points will definitely be a concern uh, and middleman attacks or the ability to personate uh, a user is always a concern on a network okay another thing that we've uh, encountered at Lockheed Martin and my team is uh, writing apps is not easy we have interns that we've uh, brought in and um, we've trained and talked to and getting them up to speed um, in general is, is difficult because they are not exposed to some of these uh, type requirements but once they do get started it's, it's great we've hired numerous uh, interns uh, that help support our program and uh, they are still with us actually we've hired them full time so hopefully we'll have opportunities to work with uh, some of you folks Mark Lorne back there is, uh, is our, our, one of our interns that will be hopefully joining us permanently on a, on a permanent basis after he's done with his studies. So, let's see, skip through these boring charts. So, um, I'll bring up this PowerPoint slide. Don't worry, it's not too many, so I won't bore you. Uh, let's see, so these are some of the uh, research on uh, IRADs or internal research and development. Uh, programs that we're actually conducting on on uh, on the uh, Lockheed's dime. Um, so this is not actually sponsored by the government. It's sponsored within Lockheed. So it belongs to Lockheed, basically. Back at my home base, we have a cyber range. Basically, we have a million dollar plus anechoic chamber where we test um, devices in. And the reason why this is special to us is because it's in a skiff area. Skiff area means a secure location. Most secure locations do not allow wireless technology in there. It's a big no-no. So with this anechoid chamber, it allows us to test wireless anything, Wi-Fi, uh, wi Bluetooth, uh, WiMAX wi technologies, uh, Zigbee machine, uh, Zigbee type devices inside the chamber, and test it up to the top secret level. So which is nice. Otherwise, uh, we'd have to go or rent space at another facility. Uh, it's going back to this. So uh, external to that building, we have a tower which we put up to simulate uh, cell towers. And it has the ability to lower and raise with a push of a button, uh, which is great too for experimentation. Um, if you notice here, war driving with this car, that's actually John Morrison's uh, vehicle that we've loaded with some uh, RF uh, type devices just to experiment with and on top of it is a container that houses uh, our instruments so we actually actually have war driven uh, around our own facility and try to penetrate our own network so that was fun hopefully uh, when you guys get in the industry you'll be doing those type uh, things too uh, one of my favorite things is the uh, RC helicopter or fly driving whatever you want to call it um, Basically, we customized an iPhone and an Android and loaded it on the bottom of this uh, Dragonfly helicopter, uh, which cost about $30,000, so we were kind of nervous flying it around. Um, so we fly it around our tower outside and try to see uh, if we could pick up signals off that tower and uh, basically run uh, uh, wireless crack devices or applications on it. So we pull it down, suck it into the phone in the uh, helicopter, fly back to home base, which is 50 yards away, and uh, we download the information and see if we can uh, compromise the network that way. Uh, I won't tell you what happened out of that information, but it was fun. It was definitely uh, great, great fun. We also have another technology called Emulab that we're 
actually uh, working with uh, another college on. Um, what that is basically is standing up network infrastructure, scratch, uh, with routers, switches, all the infrastructure, and standing up, standing up within 10 minutes. I don't know how many of you have been exposed to labs and running experiments in labs. Every time you end an experiment, you have to reset all the devices, and it's very painstaking and uh, time-consuming. Our Emulab system at uh, our facility helps us facilitate that and make it faster. So we're all about efficiency. Um, let's see. We're also, another program that we're uh, supporting and currently supporting is smart grid um, type SCADA systems and securing them. So um, we've actually worked with several power companies uh, up in uh, New York State and, and, and elsewhere to experiment with uh, their Wi-Fi SCADA systems um, and how vulnerable it is. So one of the experiments basically um, uh, addresses tower-to-tower -tower communication with uh, WiMAX um, without wires. They're just using RF communication. Um, and uh, we sent our engineers out there and we <clears throat> run experiments and try to penetrate the, uh, the RF signals. Uh, needless to say, it's it's there are vulnerabilities out there. Um, if you ever heard of the, if you have physical access to it, you own it, kind of thing. It's very true. It doesn't take much for a person to climb up on the tower, plug a Cat5 cable or Cat6 cable in, drop it down, and leave. And a month later, come back, plug in their laptop, and suck off information from there. All right. So um, WiMAX is a new technology for SCADA systems in a way where there's not that many vulnerabilities yet, but given time and resources, uh, bad guys will eventually find some holes in the WiMAX technology. And that's what we're trying to uh, find before they do. All right, so um, this is another slide that I added in last night when I was sitting on my bed. Uh, basically, <clears throat> If you notice cell towers all around in any, any road you drive down or any metropolitan area, you'll see cell towers. Uh, well, I read that this new Rubik's Cube size device that Alcatel Lucent just created uh, or has created um, will take the place of some of the cell towers. You know, so this is, this is, this is awesome. Um, it just, but it adds another another type of device where now I have to research and <laughs> figure out if this is a, a whole um, whole another issue with security so it's very interesting Let's see here another another thing that our program uh, is particularly interested in is um, zero day attacks and how to address zero day attacks and shorten the time frame between our reaction time and our discovery of zero day attacks. So we're working and partnering with several vendors uh, using their devices and heuristically learning from the network and finding anomalies on the fly and adjusting to that. Um, so we have a hack lab basically back where I work and we are using those technologies to further our research. I'll skip that. These are, uh, this slide basically just tells you the type of attack vectors that uh, are there, and we, that's what we focus on sometimes. Wi Fi, Wi Max, Bluetooth, uh, person sitting with their Pringles antenna in their car. Uh, we have those, <laughs> we've used them, they work. Um, uh, wireless encryption, decryption. We have a whole bank of uh, PS3s that we've uh, uh, tied together and basically created a supercomputer or a cloud computer system that decrypts um, encrypted wireless packets. Uh, the reason we use PS3s is because the, uh, the chips on them are specifically designed to address uh, those types of uh, vector, vector programming and vector uh, decryption algorithms. So it's very, very suitable to that. So, and basically the slide speaks for itself. It, these are all the venues and attack vectors that uh, we see and that are growing. I need to add like the smart grid in here, but 
you'll see it. Are there any questions so far? Let's see here. So right now, governments, companies, and individuals are relying more and more on wireless networks and devices in order to connect to the data in the enterprise and cloud and conduct business in their own ways. By expanding internet connections from data, from desktops to individuals, the world has entered a new mobile network arena. And the center of gravity for connections and search queries is converging with the center of gravity for, for world populations. As the internet of things become, becomes a reality, the number of connections and, several, and searches will jump again, and the focus of network activity may shift momentarily towards the most materialistic societies. As that happens, wireless networks will touch many dimensions of human life on the planet, be it for good or evil. Lockheed Martin is praying for this brave new world and will be looking for talented engineers like yourselves uh, who can help shape and protect it. Um, so, any questions? Has, has anybody been a part of any uh, events, cyber events or cyber security events at all? Black Hats or DEF CONs? If you had the opportunity, would you go? Well, the one in Vegas for Black Hat's pretty cool. <laughs> Obviously, it's in Vegas. I uh, went to that one with a bunch of my coworkers. Uh, we had a blast, and we learned a lot. Um, there's also lower-cost um, events like uh, DEF CON, which costs about roughly $300 or less, um, or ShmooCon, which costs about $200. Um, I recommend going to the cheaper ones because the Black Hats are very expensive. They're very uh, commercial. It's over $1,000 to go to those. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up because I'm a part of uh, this event that's coming up in April. Uh, it's called CDX. Has anybody heard of it? It's basically hacking events. Have you heard of the Collegiate Hacking uh, uh, Conference at all? Where some colleges are part of? All right. Well, the event that, uh, that I support... Um, deals with military academies and my customer at Fort Meade over at the NSA. Um, that event happens every year around the April time frame and um, what it is is a bunch of Red Cell hackers from the NSA and a bunch of military academies, the Blue Cell guys, remotely sitting uh, at their uh, respective academies to defend their network. Um, I have a video on it if you guys would like to see. And it's a about 15 minute video, it's pretty good. So I'll take the nodding as yes. <laughs> it was a 508. Let's see here. This video won some uh, pretty good, pretty good awards. I wanted to talk just a little bit about what this is. It is a game, true, but you ought not to treat it like a game. This is serious stuff. Instead of bullets, we're using packets. The outcome of information warfare might mean the destruction of a country just as much as blowing up uh, a division's worth of tanks. CDX is the cyber defense exercise. And it's a cat and mouse game. The NSA is trying to hack into a network that we've created and we're trying to stop them. Uh, we set up our own network. Basically the last uh, academy to have their network still running by the end is the winner. The competitors themselves for the trophy are the five undergraduate military academies of the United States. We have added over the years uh, the Air Force Institute of Technology, the Naval Postgraduate School, and this year we also had a team from the Royal Military College of Canada. They're not in competition for the trophy, they're in it for the learning experience. Those are the targets for uh, the Red Cell. The Red Cell are the opposition force of the attackers. Red Cell is pretty much the bad guys, and you know, we're the good guys. The Red Team is a group at the NSA that is using normal exploits. I'm sure they have much better things, but they're just using normal exploits that you can find on the internet to attack our networks. It's really just a full-on, all-out attack from the moment the curtain goes up on the first day of the exercise. <laughs> So 
Today is uh, Tuesday, 7th of April. CDX starts in uh, 13 days. So right now it's just a lot of preparation, building the network. That's kind of the key to the whole competition is having a real secure network before you go in. We're about halfway through with our preparation. We've run into a couple of errors along the way, but I think uh, we got a good start so far. I'd like to be a little further along. Uh, we'll be all right. I mean, probably have to pull all-nighter. Given a good, you know, six, seven hours, I think we could get it done. Oh, we're close. Uh, it's crunch time, definitely. I think there's always sort of that anticipation of, you know, it's just right around the corner. we got to get all our services up, make sure everything's running. Everything is up and running and can communicate with each other. They're trying some different things out with the architecture this year. We're just starting to put in the uh, IPsec from firewall rules, and we haven't really tested our uh, any of our service for vulnerabilities and making them secure. We've just gotten them up, them up and running so far. We're going to do this to Army. Mm. We have a pretty stacked team this year. We have a lot of guys who know a lot about what they're doing. Uh, we're actually probably the smallest crew of them all. We're uh, six or seven people, tops. So we take this a lot more seriously than they do. What does this look like, West Point? <laughs> uh, we have a better group of students attached to it. We've got more training for those students. We've got better support for them. We've got a better network set up, and we're going to go in better prepared. We don't actually offer any majors other than the ocean and engine room in the ocean. Coming down to the last week, things will be broken and people won't know what's going on, but it always comes together in the end. They're pretty excited. I think they have think they have a, a pretty good shot uh, of taking another good stand and, and maybe and maybe pulling off a victory this year. Well, last year we came in second place uh, of the academies, and this year I think we have a better design and we know better what we're doing, so I think we'll come in first. Uh, we're doing the bare minimum to maintain some level of uh, simplicity to it. Sanity. Sanity, okay, yeah. simplicity and sanity. Before we get started, I'd like to do a roll call just to see uh, that everybody's online. Merch Marines, Coast Guard, United States Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, our 2008 defending champs, the United States Military Academy, Naval Postgraduate School, Air Force Institute of Technology, and for the first time participating, we have the Royal Military College in Canada. You will be graded on your ability to maintain network services while detecting and responding to network intrusions and compromises. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2009 Cyber Defense Exercise is now underway. After the kickoff, about 10 o'clock, uh, Red Cell started getting down to work and going after them. I organized Red Cell in small teams, each one of which has given two of the student teams to attack. We get these images from the NSA, and um, they're already compromised, meaning that they've put all sorts of um, viruses and trojans and rootkits and things that we're not really sure what's in there. If we're going to get any callbacks, any reaction out of that malware, it'll be on the first day of the exercise. We were given a, a, a database initially, and, and some of it was filled with garbage, and so we had to go through and clean it and make sure everything was, uh, was secure on it. Several of the teams did very well with that. The other schools, we did get responses from. We are exposed. Something tried to dial out, and we ended up writing a batch file to kill the process continuously until we could figure out what it was and get rid of it. And then they locked us out of our computer. A lot of the exploits we couldn't find, and it was kicking us in the ass. We saw a lot of cases where we would get a connection just long enough to drop a couple of tools onto the target host, maybe pull back some information, and then the connection would be killed. Nice. As of right now, we think that the first two days are kind of just probing us and seeing what what type of services or what our vulnerabilities are. We've seen a lot of activity um, scanning ports and IP addresses that they think might be ways for them to get in. Overall, the red team hasn't had any really huge compromises yet. I don't think we've had anything go down all day. And we were having trouble getting into other people's websites. So I think everything's going good. Haven't compromised anything yet, so uh, we're looking pretty good. Wednesday, we started to see some fun. We were told before that we wouldn't be getting any of the, the log stuff from Alpha, Beta, or Gamma, but... All the schools had dealt with the malware. It's at that point the exercise turns into something of an endurance contest for Red Cell. 
They're very attentively scanning the target networks, looking for exact information. Started off in the morning with some scanning and then started to get interesting around 12.30 and then by about uh, 3.20, 3.30, it was, we are going all out. We knew that we were getting infiltrated. We just couldn't stop it. We've just been trying to uh, plug these holes as we find them. Royal Military College uh, and the Air Force Academy started to have their websites get attacked. Uh, the Air Force Academy website said I Heart Army for a little while. Making it so that our website no longer said that we hearted the Army. That Can't was probably you. one of our best successes so far. So, yeah. Uh, that, that one was a little embarrassing. Just a little bit. So. And we're not we're not too happy. The intrusion team saying that they're seeing a, like a sort of a very series of attacks. It was just odd. Don't worry about it. They keep connecting to the same process. Are they telling us it's Trojan? Yeah, same thing. They added a user. This game's intense. Oh, no, oh I hit a mine. No. Everything's kind of dampered by tiredness, I'd have to say. Hi! Sleep deprivation is great. It's like being drunk, but without all the good feelings. <laughs> you fought off sleep. Uh, yeah, it came hard, and it wanted us bad, but we said no sleep. I was just watching the traffic, and I was like, oh, trying to go to sleep. And we stayed up all night. Hi! I slept two hours in 48 hours. Yeah. Haven't seen the light of day for a couple days, but that's, that's all right. I'm looking to crash here in a couple hours. Um, I don't know when I'm going to wake up. I really don't care. I'm, I'm dead tired. I think Navy's going to come in last place, because computers and water don't go together. I think that the Merchant Marine Academy should come in last place. I think Naval Academy is going to come in last place. Air Force Academy. Oh, Army's going to come in first. Absolutely. I think we're going to win. I think Army's going to come in last place. Go Navy, beat Air Force. They say we're the chair force, but our chairs pull 9Gs and go over the speed of sound. Chicks dig uh, cyber. Fuzzy <laughs> bunnies. Fuzzy bunnies. Beat Navy. We're going to beat Army. Coast Guard Academy is a rival. I think every other school in the competition is going to come in last place. It's a healthy competition. I hate you. Ready? Awesome. The team... Up until today, it was doing real well, and then today, the uh, NSA sent a delivery man to our uh, our uh, office, and uh, they showed up with a big plate of ass to hand to us. So yesterday, we had a pretty good um, we had a pretty good time against Usafa, and really got him pretty well. So we're going to send out an email from USAFA to all the other schools with a couple of attachments on it. They're coming from right us? They're coming from us. us to us? Yep. All right. So they're spooked. The whole CD exercise, as you can see from the scores we got on my red cell yesterday, attachments are show some battle damage. Enjoy. The first attachment, if the other schools happen to open, will just be a nice little picture of Air Force Academy saying that they're noobs. I am a noob. <laughs> oh, that sucks. And the second attachment, if they happen to open, will open up Adobe, but instead of showing you anything useful, it will actually generate a callback to this guy to my left over here, and he'll have access to their machine. So hopefully they'll they'll ignore that PKI on their email, and we we'll might have some success with that today. It's not signed. You kidding me? Oh my God! You're hooked. <laughs> uh, uh. I'm impressed. <laughs> good talk, good talk. Good Hopefully talk. you'll be on video this year. I hope not. <laughs>We are going after the U.S. Naval Academy right now. We had um, one of our machines totally just go out of commission. They let one of our back doors slip through for a couple hours. We got a good look around, got a few files. Brent Cell was able to completely compromise the machine. Completely yeah, compromised. They hooked our box and left us a text file that had a um, little, little message from them. But then it disappeared, so they eventually found us. Now we got to start over from square one. We got lucky because they weren't able to totally 
uh, mess up the machine. I was right in the middle of like deepening our back door with a second back door and I was like executing and I was like, wait, it's not coming back. It's not coming back. Oh no, don't tell me they caught us right now. They're really good at um, stopping us before we could even get started. It's going to be harder getting in again because now they know the last thing we used to get in. Some of my red cell guys had done some research and found that just before the exercise started, a vulnerability had been released for the open fire instant messaging server. They developed an exploit on the fly for that vulnerability. The first people they tried it against were in fact the Air Force and computer technology teams, which are always very tough targets. We go years without exploiting any of their hosts. It worked. Oh, crap. There was much celebration. I mean, that, that, that's actually quite an accomplishment. They got old. They got old. They got old. <laughs> yeah. Going into the last day, there were three schools among the undergraduates, the ones that are in contention for the trophy, that were all literally neck and neck. The Naval Academy, the Military Academy at West Point and the Coast Guard Academy. And at that point, any of those three still could have won. I can't do anything with it. Names, check pigeon, check the email. Commander! The directive says local over. Reboot if you need to. They completely took hold of uh, Workstation B. I don't know. It's just not working. They have admin access to the, to the Jabberson. Army's down, RMC is down, Navy's down. Just kind of where we're at right now. The habit of trying your hardest, of being creative under stress, the habit of trying to win and winning against all obstacles is not something that you will begin on graduation day. It's something that you have to live every day of your life. This is what the military does best. They prepare leaders by forcing them to go through the experiences that they'll face during their career. They're all winners, irrespective. It is my pleasure to announce that the 2009 winner of the coveted IED Director's Trophy is the United States Military Academy at West Point. We take some of the best people we have and throw them at your networks and try to break intel. The guys standing behind me are your team leaders. We were not able to get into their networks. It feels amazing. For a few days, you know, you know, every, we were all walking tall. You know, we we had received information that the NSA was throwing everything they had at us. The Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard. We got into their network. We got into the Naval Academy network. They got a great learning experience out of it. They wanted to see a lot of action, and they saw a lot of action. Good, good, I'm glad. That was the whole point. I didn't want to saturate you with any more information you didn't need. Uh, I have a question. Yes. What, uh, what, what kind of clothes uh, would have wireless in them? Um, athletic clothes. Um, a lot of like, with athletic clothes now, you can plug uh, your phones into it and it'll, it'll, uh, It'll tie back to your shoes. Your shoes have our stuff coming out of it now, so it, it counts your steps and stuff like that. So it, there's a lot of things like um, not just clothes, but say if you're if you're um, participating in a step marathon and you have those meters, those things put out RF signals too, and they have USB uh, connectors too. So and a lot of ski jackets that you go skiing with, um, you can connect to them wirelessly. Uh, and they have built-in speakers into them. So, yeah, just 
things are going that way.